had an ordinary Australian childhood growing up in the migrant suburbs of Melbourne with my mother Pat and father Alex. There were sunny, happy days with my father telling me and my brothers stories about his days with the travelling circus. This is me at the age of six with my brothers Martin and Andrew, innocent in our little uniforms, unaware of what uniform would come to mean for us all. My favourite story was of my father's life as a mascot. He told us that he was a Russian shepherd boy whose parents had died during the war. He had been found and looked after by Latvian soldiers. They gave him a uniform and made him their little hero. To me they were excellent, they were so good to me. They gave me chocolates and what they had and they loved me and all the soldiers were like mother and father to me. Unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. I told them I didn't have a name. So they gave me the name Uldis Kuzemnik. That's a typical Latvian name. They gave me false birthday, 18th November 1933, because that's Latvian Independence Day. Maybe they took pity on me, I don't know, but they were real good to me, I remember. This was the version that everyone believed. Our family, my mother, the Latvian community. But it was only half the story. Not a lie, but a half-truth. As a matter of fact, I was going to die with my secret. I wasn't going to tell anybody. I made up my mind. Even in later years, I said, I'll never tell anybody what happened to me. I'll just die with my secret. And after I got older and I thought, well, I must find a name. I like to find a name. That's how it started. I mean, there'd always been this black hole that was my father's pre-Australian identity and He'd come to visit me in Oxford and become quite upset about being in Europe. And one day in particular, I took him down to Golders Green and then to an old Yiddish cafe in South Kensington. And he was completely entranced by the atmosphere there and hearing Yiddish, Hebrew, Polish, Russian being spoken. And that was the catalyst. And so I had this profound sense that the secret was, whatever it was, was going to come out then. I had to hide all my life. I had to make sure nobody knew. I was a Jewish boy amongst Nazis. Somebody would have been, wouldn't have been happy with that, would they? He was a Jewish boy whose family perished at the hands of the Nazis, yet he was rescued and nurtured, loved by the SS as their mascot. My father had only impressions of his past. He had forgotten his own name and even where he came from. He had nothing concrete to tell my mother or any of us. It was a complete, complete loss. Oh, I knew nobody would look for me because nobody knew I escaped, especially if my family's dead. Who would look for me? Where? All my father had to go on were two words he kept locked away inside himself, Koidanov and Panok. So he went looking for help to unravel them. I went to the Holocaust Center and I told him my story to her and they wouldn't believe me. It's impossible. They said I was some, some nut off the street. They said, oh, oh, you lived by yourself, six year old in the forest, then you lived among the Nazis, Jewish boy, it's impossible. So they looked at me, sort of, you know, that I was telling them a lie. The events were not strange to me. And the description of the events didn't exactly comply with the, my remembrance of this time, 
of the events of this time. I hesitated to believe that this is true. One volunteer at the center did believe my father. She was Alicia Plessa, and she solved the mystery of one of the words, Koidnov. It turned out to be the pre-war name of a village in Belarus that was now known as Zhezhinsk, about 40 kilometers outside Minsk. Alicia then sent off a letter to historian Frieda Reitzman at a Holocaust center there. One day a man came in and they were having coffee with her and he was a printer. He was um, printing books and pamphlets for the organization. And she was telling him that said there's a man in Australia who comes from Kuidnov and he's looking for his name. Maybe he knows. And he said, I come from Kuidnov. So that, oh, that's great, she said to him. Uh, there's a man in Australia who comes from Kudno looking for a name. Maybe you can help him. His father was a tenor. And the printer said, my father was a tenor also. Well, how can it be? My, my father was killed in 41, my mother told me. And this man was born in 1947. There's something going somewhere. So I started looking for documents and searching for things and found that my father wasn't killed. He was taken to Auschwitz concentration camp and he became a shoemaker. And so they didn't kill him because he was a shoemaker by trade. They needed tradespeople. So they transferred him down to Dachau and then Americans liberated him and he survived that. So he went back to Russia to the village where we lived and presumed I was dead with my mother in the big common grave. So he married again and had a son. And the son is my, the printer, my half-brother. Alicia got the telegram where he said that I, I'm Ilya and my mother was Hannah and my father was Solomon, you know. This is my father. Yeah. God, mom opened the letter when I wasn't home. Yeah. And she started burst out laughing. <laughs> because it was in Russian, the letter, and she didn't know who the man was. She said, gee, this looks like Alex. She must have wondered where he came from. Yeah, from Russia, of course, and not. When my brother sent to me, you know, mm. and, oh, God, she said, looks exactly like you. I said, oh, God. <laughs> it couldn't be another one. You cover that part and you just look at the eyes. You've got your father's eyes, haven't oh, you? Oh, God. Well, Very much the, so, yeah. I always dreamt, and I, you know, I thought I wish I could go back to the little village and uh, first of all find my name and secondly put a flower in mother's grave. I had to get my father back to Belarus to see if any of the information about his identity could be verified. A couple of times I thought to myself, what if my father is lying to me? What if none of this is true? I don't know why I thought that. I just woke up a couple of times in the middle of the night and panicked, because the coincidences so far are completely beyond belief. Eric Galperin, the man we believed to be my father's half-brother, greeted us at Minsk airport. He's looking for indisputable facts. My feeling is it's just going to be circumstantial evidence. The family resemblances the location of the house, <laughs> the name of this family that is found is Galperian. I will be very, very sad for him if this family turns out not to be his family. I know my father clings to this lingering doubt that this is a panok, and the first letter he can ever remember writing is the P. He's convinced he was going to write Panok.
Eric took us to meet Auntie Anya, who he said was my father's cousin and who knew my father as a young boy. We relied on Galina, our interpreter, to guide us through the confusion of details. Solomon's father and uh, her father were brothers. Because you yeah. look like him. Yes. Yeah. 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 Do you remember your granny? Do you remember your granny? She lived with you. Gita. Her name was Gita. She was living with your family. She was knitting. She, was, she could knit very well. She was knitting all the time. Do you remember that? No. No. Не помню. Не помню. Не помню. What else would you like to know? Well, I remember the pen name Panok. So, I don't know is why. Is there a family name? Perhaps you, you were friends with some perhaps, of the boys. Perhaps, I don't know. Yeah. Panok, I remember that. Многие, вот старший погиб. Это семья была, это фамилия была. Фамилия Панок. It is a family name. It, is a, it was a family that Panok. lived in the neighborhood. Ah, oh, that's why I learned the name. And they had some boys. <coughs> perhaps one of them was... Perhaps you, you were friends with some perhaps, of the boys. Perhaps, I don't know. Yeah. She's so beautiful. Love yeah. of God. Он говорит, что вы так прекрасны. Я еще прекраснее была. She she used to be even more beautiful. I can't believe it. Он говорит, что не верит, что красивее не бывает. Очень. Anya's words had reassured my father. Panok was the family name of some boys in the village who he played with. From Minsk, we made our way to Koidinov. Joining us on this journey was yet another new relative, cousin Luba. My mother is a, and your father are cousins. Ah, oh, right, mother. My cousin. mother and yeah. your father are cousins. And here is a park. The Dzerzhinsky Monument, the monument to the revolutionary. Finally, we reached Koidinov. A hero of the October Revolution. He's really worried that he's going to find, point out the wrong house. He said, What do I do? Can I do that? And I said, Yes, you must if you feel like it. Point the wrong house out. No. This is the October Street where your father lived. This is the street where your father lived. And the house. Uh, stop here. He says this is the place. And... My father's just not sure about this house. But see, it's all built up again. Maybe it's further down. It seems it may belong to a family member, Dina, the daughter of Boris Gildenberg. Dina has no idea about our arrival or even our existence. Alex, this man is going to take you to Boris's daughter. He, 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 she just now she is living uh, in her father's house. Just she's found some work here and she's working here now. She's at work now, so he's going to take you there. Ah, oh, right. You'll meet her. Okay. Eventually, though, she's brought back from work to meet us all. She is Boris's daughter, and Boris was his mother's Hannah's brother. So they are cousins, they're very close relatives. In the confusion, we found a photo that may be my father's mother, Hannah. And fancy, they found a picture of a girl, but uh, unfortunately, uh, Dina doesn't know who the girl is, but she looks exactly like their granddaughter, exactly. Please. Mark recognized her. Yeah. Mark looked at her face and I he made it photo. look recognized. I thought that it's I, Crystal. What's she doing in this photo? She's a dead ringer. She's absolutely identical. She's so like my niece Crystal, the only girl in our family. No, it's not it. No, it's not the one. Here it is. Oh, here, here. Oh, oh yes, yeah, uh, uh, It's not exactly capturing. Yeah. No. Because she's looking up rather than down. This is like exactly the way she looks. Yeah. Her expressions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you say, I? Yeah. 
you grew up here in this house yes <coughs> because she yes. she told us Там that your parents lived here and there was some building Sarajevo next Petroika. to it that could be yeah. you grew up here Apple tree. Apple tree. I always remember apple tree. Do you remember the apple tree? Yeah, apple so, tree. I used to climb a pinch an apple. These apple trees are very old. They yeah. are planted before the war. What was next what to this? What was next to this house yeah. before the war? We shall ask the neighbor yeah. maybe. What was next to this house? What was next to this house? What was next to this house? What was next to this like a shed, yeah. a shed, yeah. and my son, my father skins in it. Yeah. 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 So skins, yeah. that's right, that's right. Everything, everything. Because it's a shed. Yeah. I, I said there was a drive and then there was a shed. A shed, and the corridor and, 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 and there was hanging skins in it. Skins. Skins. Well, then it's because I remember the shed and the drive between. Yes. And I used to go and pick an apple here. Well, this, this is it. He was surviving through his memory, and he was so intent on his mind's eye that there was room for nothing else. Mark, it clicks everything I told him. This clicks now. Especially when Tom is age. That shed, because when I see the house, I said, that's not it. But there was a shed with skins, and that was the house. That's what I remember. All I went is looking for a name. And here I found hundreds of relatives. Have you found your name? Well, now I have, now I have. Ilya Solomonovich Kalperin. Finally, the question of Panok was laid to rest, and my father had an image of his mother to keep with him always. I felt that I had given my father an incredible gift, some measure of his past back to him. Ironically, gift in German means poison, and so I felt that I had also given him a curse. All these houses where Jews lived, and right. they left it for America and Israel. Some of the houses, of course, were empty because the Jews were killed. I think that ghetto was here. Here, was it? Street. This street? Yes, this street was tried to run away from the Germans, and we got caught. My father wasn't there, I didn't, it was just my mother and my family. The Germans didn't put us back into our house, they put us in a ghetto. The, the Nazi soldiers quite often break down the doors through the middle of the night, and for no reason at all come and beat all the people. My mother used to shield us, and you could sometimes feel her blood dripping on you because you, you know, she got copped all the blows. One day my mother said, we're going to be shot tomorrow, and we have to all die together. She took us in arms and told us we have to be shot tomorrow. And... Uh, I remember saying to my mother, I don't want to die. So when night time came, 
I got dressed. I kissed my mother. And I went out the back, slid out the fence. And I hid on that hill till morning time. And when the morning came, I saw them all being led to the spot. I felt like crying out loud, but I, so I said, no, you can't give yourself away. So I bit my hand so I couldn't cry because the pain was so great and the, the shooting went on all day. And 600 citizens of the town of the village of Koydenova who perished from the fascist invaders 21st of October I don't know it's I must have been on that hill there. Maybe you you were playing with the children. No, then, no, no. When you were five or six. No, no, I was looking at my family being shot here. You were looking at it? Yeah. Him with your own eyes? Yeah. And you remember this awful scene? Yes. I went over the hill mm -hmm. and just went anywhere. And anywhere, into anywhere. the field? Into the field, into, into the, the forest field. further. And who took you then? Nobody. Nobody? And wo uh, how many kilometers were you walking? Walking all the time. All the time? From village to village, from place to place. Mm. Such a biography. A small boy. My grandson is 10, and I don't even imagine what would he do. The scene of my mother's shooting is the worst. You can't get it out of your head. I want to get away from it all. I just kept going and going and going. Until night came, most of the times I remember sleeping in trees. I uh, was scared and cold and hungry, and uh, in distance I could hear wolves howling. And sometimes people let, let me sleep in their house in the oven with them. It was very real. Sometimes I slept in some shed, but mostly I remember in trees. It was cold. I got an army coat, old army coat from a dead soldier. Nobody wanted me. Because they probably knew I was Jewish and 
If the Germans catch them with me, they'll be shot themselves. How when you're Jewish? It was a big offense. If I found a body, I knew there's always some strawberries around it. And they were the biggest, juiciest strawberries because they were cultivated by the body. Must have been about eight or nine months wandering around Russia. I knocked on a man's door and asked for food. And he said to me, oh, you're a Jewish boy. I'll take you to be shot. I'll take you to be shot, he said to me. So I tried to escape, but he knocked me over and hold my hand with his foot so I couldn't run away till he finished his meal. When he finished it, he put my, twisted my hand around the back and dragged me to a school where the soldiers were shooting other people. And he said to them, here's a boy to be shot. I remember saying them. So they took me into the school. I was ready to die, but I said, I'd like some bread before I'm hungry. In, in this little room, where they put me, where there was a window where they were shooting other people, there was um, a, some boxes of ammunition and grenades. And I said, if I have to die, I blow the whole place up. At that age, I thought I'll blow the whole place up. But they come in with a bit of bread for me. The hardest part was they wanted to know if I was Jewish. They undressed me and examined me and said, yes, you are Jewish. So he said, look, I won't tell him when you're Jewish. Perhaps I looked more like a Latvian boy or a Russian boy as I was a little boy. And whoever knew that I was Jewish didn't tell anybody else. And they made me out a Russian boy. So they didn't have a choice. They didn't want to shoot me. They couldn't leave me, so they took me with them. Thank you. I'll only show you one photo, which after the, the, the Latvian army took me, how they dressed me up and how they made me. В этой в литовской армии, в латвийской армии, как его одели, и сфотографировали. Какой мальчик. Don't look like a Jewish boy. That's right. That's what probably saved me. Совсем правда? В 70-х годах бы искать и... It feels sorry that they haven't started looking for, for you before the 70s. But I didn't have a name. He's, he's very pessimistic about the possibility of finding any relatives in the 70s. He says people were reluctant to do things like that. So. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a very bad uh, toast proposer, but uh, it's been a pleasure meeting you all. And uh, it's a long way home. You're welcome. Thank you. Все очень приятные люди. To health. To health. В этом году можно чокаться. В этом году. You see. And fascists like to, to, to uh, be photographed near the people hanged by them. And later on, they were found lots of photographs. See, they're smiling, pointing at people whom they have just hanged. That's terrible. I remember. That's all.
I just had to watch what's happening. I couldn't stop the war. I was taken by the people who did all this killing. There was not a thing I could do. Not a thing. Not a thing. I knew it was wrong. I cried myself. But that's all I could do. Sometimes I wished I was shot with my mother. I didn't want to. Another time, so I wanted to live, I don't know. Who do you blame? You blame the whole world. Blame the whole war. Blame Hitler. Who do you blame? I didn't understand who to blame. I still don't know who to blame. Who do you blame for cruelty? Who do you blame? My father was taken by the 18th Battalion, known as the Kazim Battalion, after which he was named Kazimnyks. In the period he was with them, from mid-1942, they were on duty to the southwest of Minsk. From their base they made forays into the forests and villages of the region, ostensibly hunting for partisans. We can only speculate on their life there, sleeping rough, their drunkenness, their actions, and my father in the middle of them all. I remember we slept in uh, underground diggouts and there was water in them and you could, before you went down, you could see water rats, the eyes shining in the water and uh, so the soldiers used to shoot the rats before we got down to sleep in there. In 1943, the Latvian battalion took my father with them to the Volhov swamps near Veliki Luki, south of Leningrad. By this stage, the fighting had intensified. Or the general uh, who was in charge at the time, his name is Karl Slobe, he decided it wasn't safe for me to be in the, in the front to, to send me to Latvia in the care of a Latvian family. So this Jakob Skoulis had to take me to Riga and he handed me over to this man who had his chocolate factory, Mr. Zenis. Lime, lime and chocolate factory, eh? lime and chocolate. God, I remember that uncle's factory. Yeah. And this was a meeting place of all the people. Meet you at the Lima's sign, Lima clock. And you remember this sign oh, walking past God, it? Oh, God, I remember it, yeah. That, that was taken over, the original owners were Jewish, weren't they? Yeah, they was um, uh, elite chocolates, and then they, uh, when the Germans occupied it, they handed it over to so the man looked after me. He was the manager of this place. Yeah, right. Uncle. Uncle, yeah. 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 What does Lima mean? Lima means luck. Luck. Luck, oh. yeah. He had three daughters, and uh, so I lived with them in Riga. But they didn't know I was Jewish. If I go into bars, I went, made sure I go by myself in the bars. They gave up on it, because I wouldn't go in the bars unless I was on my own. Which was the gate, Dad? Eh? This was where he left you this, just there? Yeah, this sentence here. So what do you remember? What was your impression when you met Uncle? Were you frightened of him? No, not frightened of him, just strange. Strange? Yeah. Why? Strange. Well, in your person. Were you in your uniform or...? Yeah, in uniform, yeah. <laughs> and, I, I be, and I used to come here through the day in Rome, through the factory all day long. <laughs> I was the king of the place. Every minute of the day, I had to be, you know, be aware of myself, not to reveal who I am. That was the hardest part. In my mind, it was always, never let anybody know who you are. How can you succeed hiding yourself for so long? I did it. I could feel them loving me, but I couldn't accept it.
Here my father had an identity that at least he could remember. But still it was not his own. It was an insidious one, created by the Latvian Nazi elite, and it was woven into the fabric of their very privileged life in Riga. Do you think you can find your way to the house from here? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. What, what do you remember? Well, when you used to arrive in the station with Auntie, with Mitsan. First thing, we hop off the train and run to the house. Run to the house? <laughs> yeah. But you had a competition, a race to the house? That's right. Who, who got the first? Yeah, yeah, it is. Exactly as you remember? It? Exactly, exactly. Look more, <laughs> in more better better shape than now. Yeah. This was his private property <laughs> given to him <laughs> after the revolution. All oh, right. That's after a reward. Re reward for being a revolution. A good Bolshevik. Good Bolshevik, yeah. This was his dacha. Yeah. Oh, we had some happy days here. How long were you here? I used to come here every weekend from Riga, here to Zanica, to spend the weekend here. So that was in about late 1942 to... No, not 43, late 43, 43 to late 44. In the back of my mind, I... Um, I feel guilty to get here. I had to see all the other people suffer. Since I've come to Riga, I remember every day, you know, sort of, because it brought back, you know, you lock it away, but when you open up, it's sort of more, you know, this way, last few nights, I sort of seen people's faces and children's faces. I mainly remember, um, that I was lucky to survive, and the poor other kids that I saw being killed and shot and burnt, they didn't. Yeah, it's good to find it, yet it's bad to remember it. Maybe that's what it is. We'll get by. Big museum, man. Eh? Yeah, the film archives. Let's. Hope you find something good here. Documenting is to help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's indeed. Oh. You sit down next to the mark, yeah? Yes, okay. All oh, right. Im Zuge der sozialen Aufbauarbeiten im Generalbezirk Lettland hat ein Rieger Großbetrieb am Strand ein Erholungsheim für Kinder seiner Gefolgschaftsmitglieder eingerichtet, in dem die Kleinen unter sachkundiger Leitung und Betreuung den Sommer verbringen können. Der Junge in Uniform ist das Findelkind der lettischen SS Freiwilligenlegion, den sie aus ihrem Fronteinsatz mitgebracht hat und der hier erzogen wird. That's me. Oh, that's, that's me marching, that's me you think that? Oh, amazing, shocked. amazing. I knew there was a film, but I never knew we found it. Here they were, Latvian children, and my father used to depict the safe and confident future of the greater German Reich. 
Yet it was already late 1943, and the tide was soon to turn in favour of the Allies. The Zenis family and other influential Latvians were given refuge in Germany. They crisscrossed the war-damaged nation. My father even ended up outside Dresden when it was firebombed. Eventually, my father and Jacobs and Emily Zenis safely reached Hamburg just as it fell to the Allies. After living in a camp till the end of 49 in the displaced person camp near Hamburg, the different countries started to accept migrants, refugees. So the family that I lived with, Zenis family, said, we're going to migrate to Australia, you want to come too? Well, I didn't have a choice, so I said, yes, I'll come with you to Australia. And then the boat, Nelly, took us from Genoa to Melbourne. And then they sent us to the camp in Bonagilla near Albury. And uh, then they allocated you to different jobs. And I saw an advertisement, young man wanted to tour the world. Oh, that suited me fine. I said, apply verse park. So I said, well, get your gear, hop on this train and go to Ararat. That's where you join the circus. We only have a vacancy for a, someone to look after freak sheep at the moment. They gave me this job, look after 10 freak sheep and little elephant. So that was my job, to feed them and to display them to the public before they went into the main show and charge everyone five pence to come in. He married my mother Pat, a Catholic Australian girl, not a Latvian. He became a TV repairman and settled down, but he remained a good member of the Latvian community. He still remembered their kindness to him. In a sense, he still owed his life to them. They were the only family he had. My father always spoke Latvian with Jakob Zenis and his wife, Auntie. So we were never really sure what they were speaking about. We'll never really know whether Jacob Zenis knew my father's real history. After Jacob Zenis and his wife had died, my father's connections to the Latvian community became weaker. Zenis was the Latvian my father most looked up to, admired, but in his absence, my father perhaps felt freer to speak of his past. Zenis's youngest daughter, Mirza, has lived in Melbourne with Edges, her husband, and family since the early 1950s. He was a survivor. Yeah. I think there's, that, that's part of his character, to, to put on a bald front. A cold shivers run down my spine, I thought, imagining, you know, the little boy, what he had seen, with his own eyes and hiding and all that, and then keep the secret all his life. I find that amazing. That he, how could he, how, without talking, without telling anybody, how to keep a secret like that? They were a bit surprised, perhaps a bit upset, but, you know, I, I told the truth and that's it, you know. There were undoubtedly tensions among some members of the Latvian community. They would have preferred my father to remain silent about his past. No, because in the past, the Latvians looked at me like a bit of a hero, you know, they would make publicity about me, he is this good little soldier, and he turned out to be Jewish. It's, you know, that's very upsetting to somebody who brought me up in limelight, like, you know, film mm. and books and papers, and <laughs> suddenly I turn out who I'm not. What do you think it makes them feel like they it makes them look like stupid, I, the whole like, concept of hero well, and patriotism? Like you feel like you, you, I betrayed them, you know, like pretending who I was not to be. My father went to the Holocaust Centre in Melbourne a second time with his newfound information. He wanted the truth about his identity publicly acknowledged. Could you tell us about your feelings? Previously you considered yourself a Latvian. Yes. who don't like Jews, and suddenly you had to make obvious to everybody that you are Jewish. How did you feel about it? Well, I was, uh, I'm still feel that, like, yes. I'm two, two persons in one body. Yes. One has been lying there for years 
in peace and quiet, and the other one's been living a normal life, and now the other person's waking up in me. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're not getting along very well. I see. <laughs> and sometimes it's a bit hard for me to think who I am and what I am, and uh, I've got to always think very rationally mm -hmm. that what happened was my doings and uh, how the two persons grew my body I can't help it it's just the way the world turned out for me and uh, I just have to pacify each, each person in my body yeah. on one hand you consider luck and good people on the other hand you were present during the atrocities where they were killing and torturing people mm -hmm. how could you take it what do you think about it? Well, it's a very mixed, very mixed, very mixed feeling. See, you know, you, they did their job. You think the job was wrong. You thought that their job is wrong already. Yeah, this always state. thought, always thought it was wrong. But what can you, six-year-old boy, do against it? What can you do? I went through the Holocaust, and one of the questions I asked myself. Can you save your life at the cost of somebody else's life? And I would say, no. He was, by living with these people, who were extremely cruel. It's hard to describe to what extent how inhumane they were. He, we could use a word brain board, but it was more. He was incorporated of their way of life and thinking. And he reminded loyal to them till the last moment. There was a, a Latvian uh, general called Lobe. He was in Sweden, Lobe. He was my commanding officer, Lobe. It was a Nazi what was meant to be the simple yeah. recording of a survivor's Lobe. oral history turned into an interrogation. He lived in Sweden. He lived in Sweden, Lobe. So there was a war trial in Stockholm. Yes. They took him uh, to court, being a uh, Nazi. Mr. Logan, and uh, in my, well, let's call my, my stepfather, Mr. Dennis, asked me to sign a paper that Mr. Uh, Lobe was a fair man to send it to the court. Without thinking anything, I sort of went along and I signed it because I was obliged to do it, you know. He killed terribly lot of people. Mr. Lobby. He killed terrible lot of people. Well, I didn't, because I never... He first he killed the 30, he was in charge of the killing of 30,000 Jews in Riga. Really? And then he was in charge of killing the people in Ukraine in White Russia, too. There you go, see. Yeah, it seems that, you, a... that uh, you were adopted by the very, very important Nazi, Latvian Nazi group. Yeah. Unbelievable. But Mr. Dennis, I never, I never seen him or never, he wasn't in the war. He never, I never seen him any harm. He was not that of a person to and do. He had a military uniform on? No, Mr. No. Dennis never had, no. He was a private man. He was a manager of the chocolate factory Lima. All my life I've been with, me, with him. He died here in Elstermick about 10 years ago. Him and his wife both died. I, you, I, you couldn't meet any better people. Here I am, a Jew in an SS uniform, in the midst of them. So they have perhaps bitter memories of what they did, and they sort of connect me with that. I wouldn't accept him, because it's not enough to be born a Jew. You have to be Jewish in your attitude to life, in your feeling, in your thinking. It's like if you're an Australian, you have a concept of what an Australian is. The same thing, I have a concept of what a Jewish person is. To me, he's not. Hello, Andy. Hi, how you Hi, kids. Come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. Hi, Andy. Come on, Sharon. My father simply wanted to tell his story. He was unprepared for the harshness by which his childhood was judged. His story falls outside the very neat, simple categories about Holocaust experience. So it challenges the way that this collective tragedy has been written. Wait a minute, we'll get you some soft drinks. The Jewish people say, you must say to the Germans, 
I said, no, I don't hate anyone. I, I have no hate in me. Oh, we got a good mark right in front. Where are you, Sharon? Anyway, hate wouldn't, wouldn't help me, but it's only hurt myself, hate, because I see the people with hate in them, and they do more harm to themselves. They, they got bitter, they got sicknesses, they got mentally ill. I'm still a little bit normal. I believed that my father was eligible for some sort of financial compensation, as we're all Holocaust survivors. I applied to the claims conference in New York because he clearly met one of their criteria. If you were separated from your parents and you were under age 18 and you were in hiding, um, you, you are eligible for Article II payments. They didn't reply for over a year. Without even speaking to us, they sent us a blunt rejection of his application on the grounds that at the age of five, my father had voluntarily joined the SS. I called the media, so I rang him up, he must be, I mean, I said, what kind of idiots are you, you know, what kind of brain you got? A six-year-old mm. boy joining Nazi army after see what they've done to his people. Yeah, you think they would have more compassion? Ah, oh, I don't, don't think they looked at the story even. They just said, oh, mm. he you know, doesn't qualify, that's it. We weren't about to give up, so they ended up sending investigators to Belarus. And I think that was when they were finally satisfied that this story was true. Tonight's television, that's it, tonight. Oh, we missed Old Man Out. It was a good show. It's, anyway. it's a good show. That... If I want to watch, you know, war documentaries or anything, he'd never watch them. He used to get up and go, oh, I don't like those sort of shows, he used to say. And... But I had both suspicions for a long time that there was something about his past, but he, he would never tell. But, um eventually come out and that's it. <laughs> He's still the same. I've been married, what, nearly 45 years? 46 years, I should say, in September. I'm sure both my brothers have been extremely disturbed and upset by what they've learnt about my father's past, but I think they've both made conscious decisions to retreat back into the fabric of daily life in Australia and, and the, the shelter. Australia provides. I know that my father's been met with silence from some of his friends. They want the simple old Alex back, the new Australian, the, the easygoing guy. Um, he's got a word to say to anyone and loves the races and loves the footy. The ones that I've tried to get in touch sort of haven't replied to my calls or something. So I said, well, fair enough. If you don't want to talk to me. I'm still the same old Alex. I know who my past, what my past was, but I can't just switch the future, sort of, you know, what I want to be and what I don't want to be. I am who I am. He's now trapped by the story, the burden of telling the truth. And he's destined to repeat it over and over and over to anyone who will listen. He will seek verification all his life, really. Mm -hmm.